pattern matching. We've been using pattern matching uh, in the formalism, uh, and I'll show you what I mean by this in, in a bit. Uh, and some of you might even use it implicitly. Um, but pattern matching is a very powerful feature of some programming languages. Um, so the basic idea is, uh, if you've ever heard of a, if you've ever seen how a switch statement works, um, it's basically that idea, but pushed forward or pushed a bit uh, with more uh, expressiveness. So let's look at a few examples. So remember in homework three, we had this uh, eval built-in function, which given a symbol would return a function. So for instance, if I were to give the symbol plus, it would return a function. The addition, if I... Uh, if the symbol matches is the same as um, the symbol star, you would return multiplication. Uh, with a dash, you would return minus, uh, and the slash, you would return division. Um, but there is a lot of redundancy going on here, right? We're always doing this equal sim, equal sim, equal sim. So as good programmers, we try to, we always want to strive to do fewer, uh, you know, have not have redundancy in our code, have uh, the programming language should do the work for us, not us doing the work. So indeed, some languages have support for uh, this matching operator. And you can see it here on the right hand side. The idea is that you instead of when you always want to do when you always want to check if a certain value equals something, you can use a match. And this is the simplest form. And we'll see that that there exists some other more complicated uh, things you can place on the left hand side. But for now, we're simply comparing. So we're trying to repli replicate what is on the left hand side using a match. What we do is we match the symbol. And if the symbol matches the plus, we return function plus. If it matches the star, you return multiplication and so on. Uh, one thing of note here is you use underscore uh, to say anything. So whenever you want to say, I don't really care, uh, you can think of this as the otherwise. Uh, in this case, it returns false. Similarly to here, you have else. Okay, so this is uh, very simple. Um, and you may be wondering, yeah, why, why do I even need to extend my language to support this? But in the following few slides, I want to show you a bit more of what you can do with a match. It's much more powerful than that. So up until this point, it actually looks very similar to uh, the C switch statement. Um, but you can do more things. Uh, for instance, um, one thing you, you may note is, um, you may ask is, okay, what if I don't have this underscore and instead I don't have this branch? So if someone gives me a symbol that is not in one of the branches. So in the case of condition, we if you use a con, we've learned that uh, it actually returns void, but with a match, it which is surprising in many cases, and I, I actually dislike that behavior of racket. Uh, but match actually does something better. It throws an error, which is what should happen. Um, so when you know, in this case, you have you're you're checking if a value in this case number one, uh, and you only have a match for ten. Uh, of course, one is not ten, and therefore. Uh, this whole expression uh, should break. So actually, let me just open this up uh, code. Right, so if I do code, lecture 33, wreck it. And if I copy paste this, I do wreck it. it gives me an error saying no matching clause for, for one, right? But if I do one, it should return uh, true. Okay. So this is just to say that um, that's how match works, uh, the basic behavior of match. Uh, so one thing we can do is, for instance, let's say if we want to write the factorial with match, right? So this is the original. Um, how would we change it? Uh, well, Instead of doing if n equals zero or otherwise do that, maybe we could just do match of n, and then um, if n is zero, then you do one otherwise. 
which we've learned is just um, the underscore. Let me see if this is all correct. Then I do factorial of 10. Let's see if this works. Yay, it works. So it, it makes it a bit more succinct, as you can see. It makes it a bit more explicit. You're saying if n is zero, then do this. And, and if n is something else, do the other branch. So as you can see, you get a neater code. And actually, you can do something else, which is even do the match, um, uh, which means if I can, I can go ahead and I can do this. Uh, I can do define match. And, and this combines define and match because it's very common when you're writing uh, functions or functional code to do a match. You know, you always have the conditional right after the, the, the function. So you can just do... So if you instead use just the match, you would always have a function and the match, right? Like exactly like you have here. Base case and recursive step. So instead of that, you can just do define match uh, and that avoids the need for having... Um, to write the match explicitly. The only difference is that you need to wrap it um, in parentheses because if you have multiple parameters, you should be able to handle those as well. So in this case, we want to say a factorial two, version two, and then we want to write And as you can see, it works as expected. So the other version you can do is define match. Uh, you have to put the parentheses and the parentheses represents the list of arguments. Okay, so this is something to keep in mind. Uh, so you can do it in three ways. Uh, and my intent today is just to show you that actually this match is closer to what you see in the specifications. Um, so another thing you can do this is pretty neat, is you can actually um, match on the way, the structure of your um, of your list. So uh, matches understand lists. And you can just say, look, look at this. You can say this is an empty list, empty list. Okay, this is a list one, two. Okay, and this is list of two lms and this would be oh we can actually convert it to a cons cons one uh, x and y right uh, and then we have this which is um we return the rest okay so let's see what we're doing here okay, so we define this function f right let me comment this out. Let me comment this out. Okay, so what this is saying is if L is an empty list, it returns the the symbol empty list. So let's see if that works. F of list. See what work what happens. Yeah, it returned empty list. So okay, so we can uncomment this and we can write here that we're expecting empty list. Okay, let's see if that happens. Uh, of course, we need to do require rec unit. Okay, so that works. Um, next thing we can do is we can check if the list only has one element. Okay, so if the let, we can check, we can pass a list with only one element. So if it only has one element, it will not match the empty list. It will also not match the list that has only two elements and the first one is one and the second one is two. And in this case, it means it's a list with two elements uh, and we are assigning the first element to X, second element to Y. That's what we're doing here. And the third one, what we're saying is it's a list uh, that has at least one element, which is H, and T is everything else. So it could be an empty list, right? So it's not this case because the list only has one element. It's not this because of the same reason. This expects two elements, this one as well. So does it have at least one? Yes, it has one. So age is going to be um, the empty list. The, the Sorry, one. And T, what is T going to be? Well, T is going to be the rest of the list, which is in this case uh, an empty list. So let's write that here. Okay. 
see if this works. Parenthesis somewhere. Parentheses were in the wrong place. Saying that f is expecting one argument, I pass it two. So that is not good. So if I run this, it works, which means t is indeed empty. Uh, and I can confirm this. I can pass a list with four elements. And then this list would have, you know, this one, this two, this two, and this uh, one or more. So if I pass four, I should get a list with two, three, and four. Okay, and I can also have the other one with the empty list. For the sake of completeness. Uh, doo -doo -doo, uh, list one. Okay. So... What else? Oh, again, branches works like just like in con, they're evaluated from up, you know, top to bottom. Uh, the next thing I wanted to see is, oh, actually, I want to make this bigger. Next thing I wanted to see is, okay, what if I pass a list with one and two? I, well, it doesn't match this branch. Uh, this branch is saying that the list has to contain exactly one and two. So in that case, it should return uh, this symbol. So let's return that. And see if that works. Jeez, parents again. It's saying it wants uh, F12, but I give it. But again, the parentheses are wrong. Okay. Okay, now it works. So notice that it matched this one, but it did not match this one, right? Because the rules are evaluated top to bottom, uh, which means if I pass two and three, then it has to be matched by this one. Okay, so in this case, I would get uh, cons with two and three, right? Parenthesis. Okay. So this is what happens, and if um, this is basically the result of all that. Okay. So we've seen that match is very smart and it understands lists, which is great. Um, so we could rewrite map to use list. So let's do that. Oops. I'm gonna go here. So you guys remember map? Oh. So I wrote map and now I want to write map with define um, map FL. Okay, now what I want to do is a match on L. And now I want to have a branch when L is empty. So we've learned that um, we can pass this pattern to mean that the list L is empty. So if the list is empty, we return L. Uh, otherwise, uh, well, we can do it in two ways. We could do this first way. We could just do otherwise. Um, right, and if we run it, call it map two. Let's call this map two. Okay. Okay, and now I want to do check equal. I'll make sure that I have a map of uh, lambda x. What I do is x plus one. Okay, so this does plus one. If I do plus one, a list with three, 30, 40, 50, 
is the same as map two with plus one of list 30, 40, 50. Let's see if this is the case. I can't write plus one, write plus one, plus Okay, and it is the case. So this is the basic, uh, you know, we just use the list being empty, but we can actually do something more interesting, which is the second example I want to show you. Um, we can refine the pattern and notice that we can always uh, match, we can assign variables to the pattern that we're matching. So in this case, let's try to do that. So we want to use this case that says that the list has at least one element. So if the list has at least one element, um, we're calling the first element h and the second element t, which means we no longer need to do first eval. We can just refer to h. And we don't need to call rest eval. We can just call it t for tail. Um, and now the code looks a bit cleaner, right? I hope you agree. So contrast this code with this code. What we did was we made the pattern uh, more interesting, which simplified our branch. And this is a key point here. Pattern matching is doing not just expl like figuring out the structure of your data, but it's also binding or, or therefore defining variables um, on sub parts of, or of parts of that data or of that data structure. So in this case, we're taking the head, right, the first element of the list, and we're taking the rest of the list, which is just T, because that's so common, pattern matching helps you write cleaner code. So now I can check if uh, version version three it does the same thing as version one, and it does. So this is the version, the last version I just showed you. Okay, so next thing we can do is um, we can use when. Um, so let me show you this case. Okay, so next example is we have a define. And what we're doing here is, again, we're checking if the list is empty. If the list um, is not empty, we're checking if it has at least one element. Uh, otherwise, we're doing something else. So let's try to define patterns for all that. So uh, instead of con, we want to do match eval, right? And instead of empty, we just want to write list to mean the empty list. Then how do we check if the first thing uh, matches? Well, we remember we can use that pattern list ht, right? Uh, but if, but in this case, we also need, oh wait, dot, dot, dot. Um, but in this case, right, um, you would never reach the third branch, right? Because in this first branch, um, if the list has at least one, it would return the second. But you want actually to compare, um, where is your original member? Let me copy paste this here. What you want to do in the second, oops, this is the solution. I don't want the solution. Uh, in this, you want to check if the first element equals X, you do something. If it doesn't, you do something else. So what we can do is there's this really cool trick where you can do uh, when so you can add a further condition and you say, I have this pattern and I want to check that uh, H equals X, right? Which is what we want to check. So instead of doing uh, first, we can just use that variable. And if that's the case, you return true. Otherwise, I want to use the rest. So I still can write the same pattern, H, T, dot, 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 right? And if that's the case, then you return, instead of rest, you can just write t, x is still the same, and this should work, right? So if we do uh, 
compiles, great, so now I can write an example. Uh, and I can do member 2 x, um, let's say 10, and list 2, 3, 5. Uh, and I'm expecting this check equal. Uh, this has to be false. And if I do, should be true. Okay, so let's see if this works. Okay, um, and the underscore actually means uh, don't care. Uh, so you, if you don't want to, you know, you have this variable here that you're using, but T you're not using. So if you don't use something, you can just write underscore and that kind of shows you that you're not using that variable, which is good practice because you don't do a mistake by overriding. So the, the last version, we just can transform the t instead of declaring a variable we say we don't want to declare a variable uh, and here we say we don't want to declare a variable uh, and then finally we have this solution which also works and is the solution given in the in the slides so the when here uh, so this this rule is only called when the when condition is evaluated okay so another example uh, another thing that is interesting is that uh, the match also understands structs, which is great. So if you define a structure, oh, you define a structure like so, so you have foo, bar, and baz, right? Uh, and you can say, if you pass a foo, and you can define the field of one and the field of the other, and you return addition. So in this case, I want to check. What it's going to do is going to add one and two. So I can just write it a bit more explicitly, one and two. Module identifier already defined. Uh, of course, G. It's called G. Okay. So what this did this do? It's checking if X is a uh, struct, and if it is, it's assigning the first field to A and the second field to B, and the fields are defined in terms of the order in which you define them. So which is why when you pass one and two, that's the same as adding one plus two. Okay, um, so that is also a pretty cool thing of of uh, matching. It does understand uh, structs. So one thing you can notice here: this is your homework uh, three with conditionals. And now look at what can what you can do if you make everything explicit. Uh, sorry, using match. I don't know why I said explicit. So in this case, I just use define match. Um, I actually prefer a match define it in the match inside, but this is also fine. Uh, I just wanted to show it because it looks pretty much like the rules. Look. So first rule, we're saying that if we have an N, we return the N. Exactly what is in the rule. Second, we're saying if this is a variable, right, because it's an X and the syntax says that it's a variable. So if X is a variable and we are getting the value, the, the symbol directly, because match understands structs and we define the st as structs so that means we can get the x um, then what we do is we call built-in look call built-in exactly like is here the third rule is if we have an apply in this case it has a1 a2 and ef well i can say that we have a list and apply right first field is ef ef and then we have two exactly two arguments, a1 and a2, right? And the evaluation is the result is calling eval of EF, eval of EA1, and eval of um, EA2, right? Which is this. But what I want to show you is that the, um, what I want you to focus on is that the left hand side. Remember that when we ever we, whenever we have these rules, we are always checking in terms of what is the thing on the left hand side, you know, what's the input expression being checked. That is basically a match. So all your rules that you've been seeing, they are structured in the same way with this pattern matching idea. And in fact, I even use that term. Um, so pros and cons, pattern matching, you write less code, 
uh, you get some safety depending on the language. So we saw, for instance, in our uh, in Raka that you, if you, if a certain value doesn't uh, is not defined, it throws an exception rather than just returning void. But in some language, you can even uh, check at compile time that all branches have been made for the given input, which is pretty cool. Um, one problem, which might be or might not be a problem, is that you know if you do a match on a structure like so. Um, well, you can't change that structure anymore because if you stra if you change that structure, if you added another field, now you broke all the switch, all the pattern matching rules on that particular data structure. Uh, so that's one con um, or one downside of it. Um, that's basically it. I think those two are the main. So yeah, basically when you're using pattern matching is really tightly binding whatever um, data type you have um, because you have the you have to understand its structure to be able to do any kind of pattern matching um, then I have a few slides these are, these are optional uh, but it's just how would you go about and implement a match um, as you know I always like to give uh, an, an implementation of everything so in this case one, one way of implementing would be you you create a match per data structure so for instance you could write one for a match uh, which would have you have your data structure and then you would have you would take two functions one is called when the list this argument is empty the other one is called when the list has a cons right it has at least one uh, and then what you would do is in the first case you would call um, if the list is empty you would call uh, on empty and if the list were not um, empty you would call cons, where you would unpack by calling first and rest, and that would simplify. So then how would you use it? Well, you would use it like this. Uh, you call list match, you pass an L, and then you, pa by passing, by using lambdas, you can make it something very close to what you have uh, here, right? Because notice, what we're doing is we have lambda, and then all the parameters are gonna be um, the parameters of your of your match. And actually in record you can write underscore whenever you don't want to use a variable, even in the arguments of a function. So this is one way you could do to implement it. Um, and then you could do the same thing for, for our data structure. So let's say you wanted to pass, uh, do a function that matches values. You could go ahead and define a function that performs that match for you and then you would abstract it. And whenever you call it, you have to pass in the right order uh, the lambda for handling numbers, the lambda for handling uh, the void, and the one for handling closure. So this is it's a way to do it. Of course, if your language supports it, there's a lot of more stuff you can do. Given that you don't have to hard code your match per, per data structure, right? Basically, that's what the language gives you. It does that for you automatically. Um, there's also one thing, so in this case it's kind of annoying because you have to remember by heart the order of the functions. And in some programming languages you, you actually have something really neat, which is you can tag the arguments. So you, you can su provide the arguments in an arbitrary order as long as you tag them. Uh, which means you have some sort of keyword associated with each function. So in this case, how would that look like? Well, you can say, you can prefix each parameter with this thing called a keyword argument. So you do uh, pound or hash colon number, uh, void and closure, and then you could reorder this anyway. So now you have to prefix the argument with the keyword argument you want to use. So if you want to say, uh, this is a void, this is a number, this is a closure, it would be... Uh, the only benefit of this is that you could reorder, right? You could pass the void after, you could pass the number before, and you can also do it in racket so that you can provide the default number. So let's say you wanted to say, well, if the, the user doesn't provide something for one of these cases, just return void. Um, you, there's also syntax for that. Basically, you have to put a little brackets and then supply a value. Um, but that's basically it. You have a lot of... Um, this is just an extra on, on how Racket works. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Actually, pattern matching is going to be useful for your homework in, in this module. 
Uh, so please go through this and play with it. It's the only way to understand it. Have a good one.